So with that, I'd like to introduce our first keynote speaker. So our first speaker is Abe Kleinfeld, who is the president and CEO of Gridgain Systems. Abe joined Gridgain as president and CEO in December of 2013. Since then, he has led the company through sales growth of 130% per year, implemented an open source business model, and contributed the company's software to the Apache Software Foundation, uh, and that project is known as Apache Ignite, where it has graduated to a top-level project and ranks among the most active in the ASF. Today, the Gridgain in-memory data fa fabric is recognized as a leading open source in-memory computing platform as it, and is in use across many of the world's largest global corporations and startups. Prior to joining Gridgain, Abe was president and CEO of network security leader InCircle, a company he led from early stage with a handful of customers through 10 consecutive years of revenue growth, five consecutive years of profitability, two acquisitions, over 6,500 enterprise customers worldwide, and $40 million in annual sales. In April 2013, InCircle was acquired by Tripwire. Before InCircle, Abe was CEO of a number of successful startup companies and has been in the industry for more than 35 years. Abe? Thank you very much for, can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Um, I can't hear myself. So thank you very much for uh, attending the uh, In-Memory Computing Conference, the second annual In-Memory Computing Conference. Um, again, my name is Abe Kleinfeld. I'm president and CEO of Gridgain. And uh, no, this is not what I'm going to be talking about today. <laughs> um, I will not be going through any code snippets with you. Um, in fact, I'm not really very good at that sort of thing. Um, but I did want to illustrate the fact that we have a tendency in this industry to lose sight of the awesomeness of what it is that we're doing. We are actually changing the world. We're doing massively difficult things that are gonna literally change the way human beings live their lives. And we have a tendency to explain it in ways that nobody can understand. So I'm going to avoid that today. We will not talk about the uh, sausage making. We have the rest of the conference to do that. Uh, I'm gonna try to talk a little bit higher level than that. Um, and this is easy for me to do because um, I really didn't start out in the in-memory computing world. I spent 35 years in the industry, and I do have a computer science degree from back in 1979 with punch cards, um, and back in the days where you actually used things like drum storage and core memory. Um, but, the, uh, but I actually have been out of the deep technical stuff for quite a while. I really kind of focus on the business side of things. And so it was very easy for me to kind of step into this market and look at it from the top down rather than from the bottom up. Uh, but I remember when I was interviewing for, uh, for this job at Gridgain, I met with the CTO of Gridgain, uh, Nikita Ivanov, who's probably here in the audience somewhere. And um, I said, well, so what is this stuff? And by the time he got done telling me and my eyes had glazed over, I just kind of said, but what does it do? And he said, well, uh, it, it makes things very, very fast. I said, okay, now we're getting somewhere. I said, how fast? And, and he said, well, we just did a, uh, a benchmark. We just finished a benchmark with a very large international bank, and they put us to our paces as part of competitive RFP, and we were able to demonstrate a billion transactions per second, uh, full financial asset transactions per second. And I had been in the database business for many years, so I, I thought, wow, okay, a billion, is that's a lot. That's a lot of transactions per second. I think that probably if you trick out an Oracle database with millions of dollars worth of hardware, you're probably going to end up with something like, I don't know, 20 million transactions per second. So a billion is a lot. And in my mind, I saw this grid gain software running on pretty much the entire Amazon you know, you know, cluster. In other words, all, we must have used up all of AWS to get a billion transactions per second. And he, so I said, well, what did this run on? And I was expecting this big data center explanation. And he said, over there, in a in a, we had this little closet in the corner where we had scotch tape and printer toner and tissue paper. And uh, in there, there was a rack. And it was about my height. And it was almost all empty. And just like the top 20% had anything in it. And it basically had these 10 Dell blades. And I said, well, what did this cost? And he said, well, there's 10 Dell blades. Each one is configured with about 100 gig of RAM, so it's a, a terabyte of RAM. 
Um, he said it's uh, probably about $2,000 per blade plus the hardware, you know, the networking and the rack. It's $25,000 worth of hardware. And that's what amazed me. Because what we are sitting on, what I realized at that moment is that we are sitting on this powder keg that we can ignite and explode innovation to every corner of the world. If you can do a billion transactions per second or just cut it in half on $25,000 worth of hardware, that's basically a credit card limit. That means that what used to be the purview of huge organizations with the deepest pockets who couldn't even approach this kind of performance is now available to anybody in a garage with a credit card. And that is what's amazing about what we are doing here today and what this group of people are involved in. We are going to dramatically change and transform the world that we live in through the technology that we're providing. We are the peanut butter in the peanut butter sandwich. Now, of course, this hasn't been around forever. We all know that in memory computing has been around since, oh, I don't know, the mid-90s, I guess. Um, and and um, as usual, um, you know, back then, I think, I think uh, RAM was something like $35 per megabyte. Today, it's under a penny per megabyte. So obviously, the costs have come down, has made in-memory computing much more popular. It's taken a long time, though, uh, mid-'90s. But of course, it well, hasn't been around since the mid-'90s. It's actually, it's actually been around a lot longer than that. So um, this is the Remington Rand Science, Univac Scientific Computer. It's an ad. Uh, and it's uh, from 1956, which is probably before almost everybody in this room was born, even before I was born, although not by much. Uh, and what's interesting about it is that it's an in-memory computer, and it's actually an advertisement for an in-memory computer. It actually moved the data from disk into RAM, or back then it was drum storage into core memory. Core was these little rings with wires coming in, and you either magnetized them uh, clockwise or counterclockwise to represent a zero or a one. Uh, but the concept was the same. It was very fast, much faster than drum storage. So if you can move your data from drum into core, things were going to run very, very fast with the same basic principles as today. So going back to 1956, in fact, if you read the text from this, there's only one commercially available computer capable of real-time performance. It's ideal for simulation and online data reduction. It solves complex problems from purely sensed data at speeds that are compatible with real-time control. You could actually take this text and put it on any of the websites from the sponsors today, and it, and it probably would look exactly the same. <laughs> so we've actually been talking about this and doing this for a long time. So then the question is, well, what's changed? Well, what's changed is, the cost of computing, and in particularly RAM, has come down dramatically. That didn't happen overnight. It happened in a pretty linear way, about 30% per year, over a year, over a year, over a year, but for a long period of time, my entire life, frankly. Um, but the real change is the demand. What's happened is internet scale and data growth have exploded, and most of this has happened very, very lately, like in the last 10 years. And so what we have is a situation where the economics are irresistible, basically free. On a credit card, you can put a billion transactions per second. And finally, the demand is here for this kind of performance, which was not here that long ago. In fact, if you go back 15 years, like around 2000 during the dot-com period, um, you know, the internet was just taking off virtually all applications were internal applications to corporations. A huge application might have 50,000 users on it and deal with gigabytes of data. What the internet did is it turned everything inside out. These applications that were being used by employees suddenly became applications that got used by consumers. So the same systems that were being used by employees were turned inside out. And so rather than bank teller, rather than calling a bank teller up and telling him to transfer money, you did it yourself online. And the number of customers that were coming in far exceeded anything that people had in terms of employees. And that's when things started to escalate. So today, we're dealing with millions and billions of people or connected devices or computers that connect into systems. And we're dealing with terabytes and petabytes of data. That's what's changed. And almost all of it has happened in the last 10 years. AWS, Facebook, Azure, uh, Google Compute, Twitter, 
Um, I mean, just about anything you can name that talks about speed and scale, that requires speed and scale, WhatsApp, um, you know, the list kind of goes on and on, happened since about 2006. So this, even though in-memory computing has been around forever, the demand and the, uh, and the economics have really come together in the last probably five to 10 years. And that's why we're here today. That's why all of a sudden this is the peanut butter and the peanut butter sandwich. So just about everything you can think of today demands in-memory computing. All the hot categories of computing today demand it. Cloud, SaaS computing, uh, mobile and IoT platforms that are dealing with billions of devices, social networking, online retail, uh, gaming, um, fintech, all of this stuff requires speed and scale. And it is, it really is about speed and scale. So it's not just about moving your data into RAM to make it fast, you also have to make it scalable because we're, we're dealing with not only the need for a very fast response, but we need a very fast response across a very large group of people or devices. So what we have today is tremendous growth in data that's both being produced and consumed by billions of things. And that's only going to continue to escalate. And the only way this can continue to go down its own path is to have in-memory computing. Without it, we basically halt everything and wait until Moore's Law catches up. So uh, this is the transformative technology for the future. But of course, there's more to in-memory computing than just memory. Uh, in-memory computing is really uh, uh, very, very important, obviously. By moving your data into RAM, you can access the data much more quickly. But it's also about distributing the computing, uh, about taking advantage of the fact that you can have a large cluster of commodity hardware and distribute not only the data, but also the workload, the compute, out to the data to minimize the movement of that data. And so you need to be able to provide both speed through in-memory computing and scale through distributed computing in order to achieve the needs of today's market and tomorrow's market. But it's also about high availability. Uh, nobody is using in-memory computing to speed up Microsoft Word or PowerPoint. Um, everybody is using in-memory computing, which is frankly still kind of hard to use. Um, everybody's using it for mission critical applications. You're using it to speed up the, the core business products that you're offering to customers. And so as a result, you need very high availability. But also in memory computing is driving convergence on many, many levels. Uh, convergence of data storage models like Hadoop and RDBMSs and key value stores and lots of different things, that graph databases. It's also driving convergence of processing models where we used to have completely separate organizations and separate computing architectures for OLAP and OLTP. In memory computing is actually bringing these together. It's what's enabling uh, the concept of HTAP, hybrid transaction analytical processing, where you can actually start to do analytical processing off your operational data without affecting the performance of the operational systems. Um, that's critically important in order to do any kind of real-time analysis of what's happening with sales or inventory or anything like that in large corporations. So in-memory computing is enabling these kind of things. And it's also driving convergence of memory and storage. In fact, before long, it's going to be hard to tell the difference of where memory stops and, and storage begins. Um, it used to be very simple. You move data from disk into RAM, it ran much faster. And now we've got all these other things that are happening. NVDIMM, that, that's uh, kind of breaking the whole model of, well, wait a minute, I thought RAM was volatile. Well, now it can be non-volatile. Uh, oops, go back if you would, please. Um, I don't know, did I, what happened? Can you go back to that slide that I was at? Back, 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 back. There we go. There, perfect, thank you. Um, and so essentially what we have is, uh, is tremendous convergence that's happening on many, many fronts and is being driven by in-memory computing. Um, and also in-memory computing is also about open source. Uh, much, most of the in-memory computing technologies today are being open sourced or are open source already. And open source is a phenomenon that um, it's not just about religion. There's a lot of thought that, oh, well, you know, developers are just religious about open source and it's really all about that. It's not about that. In fact, it's not about that at all, although you know, there's some of that going on. It's really about customers being able to control their own destinies and participate in the roadmaps of the products that they use and the technologies that they use. 
Uh, this is why open source is becoming so popular even in large enterprises that initially resisted it. They're trying to break the lock of the monolithic vendors and move into a direction where they can participate in the creation of the technologies that they want to use. Uh, you know, Google and Facebook led that world by basically dropping a lot of the commercial products and creating their own infrastructure. They build their own computers, they build their own software, they build everything. And open source, and that's, that model is moving into large corporations now as well because it drives much more granular competitive um, uh, capabilities for them. So uh, it's interesting because open, open source, uh, I was not an open source guy. I actually, this, this is my first company where I got involved with open source. So I, my eyes have been completely opened. Uh, and I would have never thought this possible. I mean, Gardner says that by 2020, 98% of IT organizations will basically be running on open source and mission critical applications. Um, and in many cases, they won't even know they're doing it. Um, actually, they will know they're doing it. There's lots of ways to find out. But 2020 seems like a long way away. It's three and a half years from now. So when we talk about 2020, it's like next week. Um, so essentially, open source has eaten the world. Now, um, almost all of the limitations that we have kind of grown up with when it comes to in-memory computing have now been pretty much dealt with. How much can you store in RAM? A lot. You can store a lot in RAM. In fact, you know, uh, I think last week or this week, Amazon just introduced their X1 instance uh, that for $13.34, uh, you can basically, you know, per hour, you can basically rent a two terabyte cluster. Two terabytes of RAM. It costs nothing. Uh, you can store a lot in RAM. And of course, there's a lot of things happening that is extending RAM uh, all the way out to, to very, very fast storage, uh, such that all of that is merging and converging. It's all going to be one thing. Does everything need to be in memory? Are the economics of memory compelling enough? Uh, you know, what happens to data in memory when the power goes off? All of this is being addressed very, very quickly. Even since I joined GridGain two and a half years ago, um, where some of this stuff, these are hard questions back then. Now they're, you know, they're, you, just, you just dismiss them. They're, they've been dealt with. They've been dealt with. That's how fast this market is moving. Um, so today, when companies are building systems, and it's amazing how often I still get asked questions like, what, what is in memory computing? <laughs> Most people still don't know about it. In fact, most people in large corporations and even in startups that are building systems today still don't know about it. It's our jobs to make sure that people start to understand what's possible because the reality is that if you're building systems for the future, you must do it using in-memory computing. It makes no sense to do it any other way. There's nothing that you're building for the future that doesn't require the speed and the scale that this kind of technology actually delivers. Modern apps must be built for speed and scale. A, larger, a large proportion of apps are now being built up in the cloud, for the cloud. They will never be run on premise. Uh, and all you have to do is go to the uh, you know, Amazon conference you know, that happens down in Las Vegas, and you can see that there's been a massive explosion of cloud-based computers computing, and a lot of people have started businesses up in the cloud. They will never go anywhere else, and they are built to scale. Um, so this is the reality that we're living today. And we also have an interesting other phenomenon going on that, that IT has been tasked with driving innovation, but at the same time, reducing cost. And what's interesting about that is that in-memory computing is extremely well suited to both. In-memory computing is going to drive tremendous amount of innovation because you can maximize the performance of the infrastructure that you have by using in-memory computing technologies and you can suddenly start to deliver capabilities that were impossible just five years ago. At the same time, things like OLAP and OLTP data warehousing and the, and, and the, and the operational systems can start to merge, and there's going to be massive reductions in cost as a result of it. So we happen to be on both sides of that equation, um, and, uh, and, and it's a very exciting place to be. We have an opportunity to transform not only the innovative capabilities of large corporations, but also drive cost reduction in IT, which is a very important part of the tasks that IT has to do today. Um, so what, what will this all enable? Where is this taking us? Well, a lot of us already have like nests at home. How many of you have a nest at home, a nest thermostat? Um, people have, not that many of you. Well, you guys are low-tech people. Luddites, Luddites out there. Um, 
we are also, of course, moving towards automated locks and lighting systems, all kinds of stuff in our homes where we're starting to connect our you know, components of our homes into the cloud. And in a very short amount of time, all our homes will become connected and become part of smart cities. Now, a lot of what's driving smart cities, actually, is lighting. Uh, what's happened in cities is they're replacing the old-fashioned lighting, which is very expensive, with LED lighting, which is very inexpensive. And the, LED, the cost reduction for moving to LED lighting is funding the replacement of all the lampposts. And so all these lampposts with LED lights on them that can be remotely controlled are now becoming communications hubs. They're becoming the infrastructure for smart cities. And all of these communication hubs also have sensor nests on them. There's sensors for everything. There's sensors that are doing um, uh, you know, surveillance. There's, there's sensors that are doing traffic control. There's sensors that are doing air quality monitoring. There's sensors that are uh, doing you know, weather monitoring. There's sensors that are doing you know, gunshot triangulation. There's sensors for everything. And once you have that basic infrastructure in place, all of this smart city stuff can come together and you suddenly have cities that can self-adapt, that can change traffic patterns based on events that are happening, that can immediately deploy resources to various parts of the city based on what's happening, uh, whether it's an event or whether it's a disaster or an accident or a fire. All of this stuff can become automated in these smart cities. And those of you who live here in the Bay Area have seen this, especially if you lived here for a while. The Bay Area has become a city. It's, become, it's turning into a mega city. It used to be San Francisco, and then some little towns, and then San Jose, um, and now it's all one thing. It's like the, the Bay Area. Uh, it's the Bay City. And what's happening is that you know, in the early 1900s, about 2 in 10 people lived in cities. Today, 50% of the world's population live in cities. And by the middle of the century, which is not that far away, 30 years, I'll be struggling around here in my 90s, but in 30 years, 70% of the world's population will live in cities. Cities are getting huge. And they're going to collapse under their own weight unless there's a lot of automation and speed and scale and computing that automates all of the functions of these cities. Otherwise, they cannot exist. So in-memory computing is enabling the future. Things like adaptive traffic control and driverless uh, roadways. Um, you know, Initially, these cars are kind of self-driving. But that's not going to last very long. You're going to have to have some massive control that can, that can make sure all of it is working together. Uh, biometrics are becoming smarter, and you're going to be able to start putting, we're already wearing devices, right, Fitbits and things like that. It's only a matter of time before these devices become small enough and become embedded into our, into our bodies, and we're going to become you know, walking class C networks. Uh, you're going to have things that automatically deploy drugs in our bodies that do monitoring for health care. Uh, initially, it'll be the most critically ill people that'll have this kind of stuff built in. But over time, we're all going to have this stuff built in because it's going to enable us to have a sixth sense. Before we cross the street, we're going to know that our car is about to hit us. All of this stuff is going to be built into us. Um, and it's all going to be enabled through the cloud, through very fast communication links, through massive speed and scale, through in-memory computing. Um, the smart energy grid, you know, these energy grids were actually built with the concept of having a few power plants delivering power or energy to millions of households and businesses, now those millions of households and businesses are themselves power plants. I, you know, my house has uh, solar power on it, and I feed the energy grid. I'm one of those power plants, so I use energy and I feed it into the system. You need to have smart energy grids that can continue to, to, uh, to both monitor the incoming and outgoing um, uh, energy. Um, things like augmented reality cashless society and uh, real-time payment, you know, if you sell something on the App Store, it could take you 60 days to get paid. If you do a wire transfer, uh, it goes through a very long wire because it takes days before it gets to the other side. And why is that? Because there's a lot of intermediation and trust systems that are in the middle of all this. As we move towards a cashless society and more through a blockchain type, type uh, transactions, we're going to move into real-time payments. That's going to require a massive amount of speed and scale. Um, there's, you know, AI-based surveillance and, and security. There are more surveillance cameras in the world today than there are people. There's something like 1.1 cameras for every person in the world today. And guess what? There's going to be more of them. So how can you possibly, who's watching this stuff? It has to be done through automation. It has to be done through AI. Um, you know, cognitive systems. Anybody ever seen the movie Her? 
If you haven't, you should see it. It's, a, it's the in-memory computing movie, if you will. Um, it's basically uh, about where Siri will end up uh, in another 10 or 15 years. It's definitely worth seeing. Uh, and we're going to go from basically assistant to partner with these cognitive systems. Um, the Internet of Flying Things. Uh, how many of you own drones? Anybody have a drone? Come on, you Luddites. OK, there's a couple of them. OK, all right. So uh, believe it or not, the FAA is saying that by 2020, three and a half years from now, there will be 2.7 million commercial drones in the air. If you throw in all the hobbyist drones, I have a couple of them myself, um, it's 7 million. Now, for some context, there are 5,000 airplanes in the air at any given point over the United States. So we're going to go from 5,000 airplanes in the air to 7 million flying things out there. Um, guess what? In memory computing, that's the only way you're going to be able to control all of this. So we are driving all of the innovation in the future. You take out this room, and none of this happens. In fact, what I think you can expect is some also other massive changes. Um, can we go to the next slide? There we go. Uh, there's also some paradigm shifts that are occurring. Uh, there's a shift from products to platforms. I mean, you go back to 1976 or so when the Sony Walkman came out. They sold 50,000 of them in the first two months, and they sold 186 million of these things. But they were products. They were standalone. You basically put it in your pocket. You went out and bought music from it, for the, from the store for it. Uh, it all was self-contained. It was a product. Same thing with the Macintosh, the same thing with the IBM PC, the same thing with almost everything you bought. They were products. Today, we've shifted over to platforms. Uh, when you buy an iPhone, almost all the functionality in the phone comes from somewhere else. You download the apps from the App Store. You use iCloud. You use things like Siri. Almost all the functionality is happening somewhere else, and the phone is just the connection to the platform. The same thing with Amazon, for example. Amazon is a platform company. They, they don't have products. They basic, almost all of the profit come from, from third parties selling stuff on their platform. Um, this is true with gaming companies. You're starting to see it happen to automobile companies. There are entire industries that are being, um, that are being kind of broken as a result of this, like the hotel industry through Airbnb, uh, the taxi industry through, through Uber and through Lyft. And these are platforms. We are moving towards a platform world where rather than producing products, you produce platforms with a lot of stickiness. But of course, they're completely dependent on speed and scale. You cannot have any of these platforms without massive scale and the ability to process all of that data very, very quickly and deliver results very, very quickly. Another major paradigm shift that's happening is that jobs are for machines. So if you, uh, if you look at this chart, I know it's small, but basically what it's, it shows is there's kind of four types of jobs. There's routine and non-routine, and there's cognitive and manual. Of course, cognitive is the stuff that uses most of your brain, and manual is the stuff that uses most of your bodies. Um, and basically what you can see is that by about 1990, we used to have four engines of growth. We used to have this you know, routine cognitive, non-routine cognitive. We used to have routine manual and routine cognitive. So we had four engines of job growth going up until about the 1990s. And all of a sudden, the routine stuff flattened out and then started to decline. So now we only have two engines of job growth. And guess what? Things like deep learning and robotics and AI are going right after those. We are moving into a world where there will be no jobs, or very few jobs, or they'll be defined in a totally different way. If we can go to the next slide. Um, oh, go back. There we go. Perfect. Um, so in the, in the US president's economic report for 2016, this came out just a few months ago in February, kind of in the middle of it, there was some stunning information in there. It showed that there's an 83% chance that in the near future, jobs that earn less than $20 an hour will disappear. So $20 an hour is about $40,000 a year. 63% of American workers earn less than $40,000 a year. There's a 31% chance, 31% chance that jobs under $40 an hour will disappear. Now, that's $80,000 a year. 87% of American workers earn less than $80,000 a year. 
So are we all going to live in caves and are, all, are we all going to starve? No, that's not what's going to happen. There's going to be societal and political change that's going to occur. And something like universal basic income is going to come into play because, frankly, we're not going to need to work. The computers and automation are going to provide a lot of the necessities for us. And we're going to be able to have kind of a basic level of income. And we're going to choose whether or not we want to work. And if we choose to work, by the way, a lot of psychological testing has been done on this. And it shows that given a choice, people choose to work. People choose to do things. But we will choose to do the things that are interesting to us. Some of us will sit around and smoke dope, no question about that. I might be on medicinal dope by then. But, uh, but, but a lot of us will choose to do things and become creative in other ways. But we're going to separate income from jobs. Jobs will be for machines. Living will be for people. We're going to move into another interesting world. And this is not that far away. And it will once again be powered by the kind of technology that we're pro pr producing here. So um, we are the future. We are the future. We're where the world is going. We are powering virtually all of the innovation that's happening out there. It just cannot happen without the in-memory computing component. Uh, so this is a great place to be. I don't know how many of you have worked in other industries and other areas, but there's a lot of jobs where you don't change the world, including in the technology industry. Um, you happen to be in one of those areas where you will change the world. So I urge you to keep that in mind as we move forward into the, uh, into the conference. And you, we talk about memory modules, and we talk about uh, you know, source code. Um, keep in mind that we are doing more than just developing deep, deep, deep technology. That's too hard for anybody to understand. And so um, if Oscar Wilde were here, um, he would say that, uh, yeah, we are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the flying cars. So I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.